Alrighty, uh, this is a project that I've been tinkering away at in the background. It is finally coming together and so I thought I would throw up a quick video uh, just showing kind of what's going on. I'll go back and uh, work away at it a bit more and then I'll hopefully be able to upload it for other people to use and I guess throw up the code for it on GitHub. Um, I'll get some advice as to what the best way to do that is. It definitely needs some cleaning up first. So what this is all about, uh, various different ways of testing input lag. Obviously the video interrupt method is probably one of the more powerful ones. NVIDIA's um, latency analysis is very powerful, um, but can be quite challenging and does have uh, you know, hardware requirements in order to get it going. Um, and then I guess the other major one is the camera method. We're just recording the screen, having some visual cue for when a button is pressed, and then counting in between that. There are some big advantages to this. So I think the simplest one would be when 4K 120 um, VRR comes, then there's nothing that will allow that to be tested based on what we've got at the moment. And even if NVIDIA releases a, uh, a latency analyzer for that, um, based on previous experience, it will be very expensive. And so potentially then, the trusty camera is the, uh, the one that can actually do that the most effectively, which is certainly one of the reasons I've been working away at this. Um, obviously the disadvantage to the camera method, one is you do need a, a clear kind of point at which the button is pressed and point on the screen to uh, unambiguously decide that something has happened. Um, there are issues with kind of counting down, which is often not accounted for, and so forth. But I think the biggest one is that it's just very time consuming. That you, you, you know, I don't know if other one, anyone else has uh, automated or improved the setup, but you, you generally have to, you know, count through each frame for each uh, animation, and it takes a lot of time for not a lot of a result compared with some of the other methods. So anyway, I've tried to streamline that with my testing. So this is a video, Guilty Gear, uh, which I think I was just looking at VRR from memory. I've created a program and thrown the video at it. It will tell you what frame you're on at the moment, how many frames there are. You've got the ability to jump to a certain frame if you want to. Um, so for example, if you you know messed up at the start and just wanted to skip a minute or so, you can do that. Um, the scroll wheel also lets you jump forward and backwards. And so you can fairly quickly get to where you want to be. Uh, this was all coded in Python, by the way, because that's what I have familiarized myself with, um, as always with no computing background. So you can see up the top that we've got these numbers. The one at the top top is probably the most important for now. What that will do, it will show you the amount of blue, green and red that are underneath your cursor. So if we're on something that's very white, then it'll have a lot of blue, green and red all put together. Presumably Kai's jacket, gosh, I made that mistake last time I recorded, Sol's jacket will have a lot more red than it'll have blue or green, uh, or if we go over something that's blue, then you'll have a lot more blues and greens than reds. Um, so what we want first is to find a color change on the screen, which is when the button is pressed. So you could do this with like a finger coming through, going dark, back a light background to a, a dark shadowed finger in the foreground, um, something like that. I think an LED is often the, the cheap way to do it. Not free, but takes a, just a touch of tinkering, um, but tends to be fairly unambiguous, although I'll make mention of that in a second. So what I do is I scroll until my LED comes on, scroll back a frame, click on that spot. So that's, you know, it's got eight, three and nine, um, is how much blue, green and red there are on an essentially black background. And then when you go to the next frame, now we've got more like 255 for all the different values. The next thing I do is to set a threshold. And so these are, are these numbers here. And so what we're saying is we want this spot that we've chosen, it needs to get above 50 for blue, green or red uh, before we will acknowledge that um, a change has happened. And so you can set whatever number you like. If you were doing subtle changes in color, then this would be quite effective for, for it. Um, so that'll do for now. I will uh, scroll back a bit and then we'll start the analysis going. So you can see what's happened is you've got your, th this is your frame 
where it says that the light has turned on. It's kind of run through the video and it said here, here's where a button is pressed um, because here's where the LED light is turning on. You can have a look at the frame beforehand, you can have a look at that frame, you can have a look at the frame afterwards just to confirm that you are happy with how the program is interpreting it and there is the possibility that you can tinker with it which I'll explain in a second. But for now, so it's shown us that frame zero essentially and then you've got the next series of frames where you're looking for an animation change. So you can look at frame four. So Sol still has his arm down and the command history still isn't activated. And then on frame five, you can see the command history is activated and Sol has lifted his arm. So we can decide that that is the frame where something has happened uh, and it will save that away and then it'll scan through to try to find the next instance of something lighting up. So like we said, you can see here, hopefully, that the LED light is lit, but it's not as kind of intense as the previous one. So presumably we've just kind of caught it mid-change. Um, and this is where uh, often I struggled when I was doing this manually. Because, uh, you know, is that lit up or is that not lit up? We, we've got we can do it, thankfully, automatically, where, well, the, the, the red values are above 50, so therefore, by definition, it's lit up. But let's say we wanted to be on the um, pessimistic end of things. You can click on the, the plus one, and now that'll be counted as not lit up, and this will be counted as lit up. It doesn't change the threshold, so you'll have to do that each and every time. But, you know, if you wanted to kind of manually um, change what you thought was, wasn't actually pushed or was pushed, then you can do that. Having done that, we can scan through again. So you can see on this frame, so frame five, the command history is lit up and Kai is lifting, Kai, Sol is lifting his arm. So we can click there. All right. We might just quickly take a break there so we can exit out with escape. What we can then see, hopefully, is that it has recorded our results. All right. Uh, and so it has um, put those into a CSV file and then that is editable and, and so forth. My plan is to add a whole lot more here, um, but that can come in the future. So things like total number of frames, total number of trials, uh, frames per second in the video and so forth. Now, just to add one more layer of complexity, in the same way that we can look at when the button is pushed, We can also do that for animation, for the character. So before we were saying that Sol lifts his arm and that's our marker. So you can see here, we've got quite close to white, so high kind of 200s for each one of those. If we right click on that and then go to the next frame, you'll see that there's a, you've gone from a very white image to a blue image. So we haven't lost a lot of blue, we haven't lost a lot of green, but we've lost a lot of red. So what we can do is we can choose or tell the program to only look at the red intensity. We can uh, drop the threshold below. So the thresholds will work in either direction. Uh, you can have a dark going to light or you can have a light going to dark and either one of those is acceptable. Uh, and then if we skip back, hopefully, and it has been a bit problematic. Um, what will happen is you'll get the same screen, but now if you look at it, so same again, this is when our light came on, that's when it's off, that's the frame after it's on. We can drop back one, so you get all of the different frames. So you've got zero, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four. You'll notice that the five is now green. So on the four with the, the red, that's before something has happened. And on the five, the fifth frame after our button push, you will see that the animation has been triggered and it's giving us a, a nice clear visual cue that something has happened. So that's just to, to try again to streamline the process. I think I, think I could probably automate all of this, um, but we'll see. Uh, I might leave that as an option. Obviously, if things are moving, so say you were playing Devil May Cry or uh, like a shooting game with a moving background, then that might inappropriately trigger it or it might the, the thing that you're looking at might move about. And so then you wouldn't want that to kind of interfere with the results. 
but it, it does seem like it should hopefully be fairly helpful uh, in terms of um, recording off the screen uh, and letting people quickly analyze their videos to get their results out um, and I guess just add to the, the knowledge pool so you can upload the video at the same time as you upload the results and you know potentially contribute to all the testing that needs to be done. So I'll leave it at that, I'll upload this video at some point and uh, I'll keep tinkering away.